Jurassic. Hey everybody, welcome to chapter 17. This is Dr. O, sorry. Uh, life cycle nutrition, adulthood in the later years. So we've, we've gone through pregnancy and lactation, infancy, childhood, adult, uh, early, early uh, adolescence. So now we're just talking about uh, the near the end of life. We're talking about uh, not uh, adulthood, but uh, you know your typical recommendations we have, your 20s and 30s or 40s are all going to be about the same. But you will see that we talk as someone becomes elderly and, and gets older, how that's going to impact the nutritional needs quite a bit. So we're going to focus really more on the later years or the elderly years more than anything. Big, you know, uh, uh, about one, excuse me, about 20% one, or one, one in five of, of Americans are over the age of 65 now. Uh, 85 plus is actually the fastest growing population in the United States. So, so this is uh, clearly a, a big, a big concern, or helping make make sure that this the the growing elderly population, the baby boomer population and beyond, um, helping them stay really healthy. Right, this is a it's a whole different ball game than it was 100 years ago. The life expectancy in, in 1900 was 47, and now we're looking at 78, 79. Somewhere in that ballpark. So it's it's amazing what's happened in the in the last 100 120 years. You know, in 1907, I know uh, the two two leading causes of death were basically um, pneumonia and uh, diarrheal diseases, tuberculosis, things like that. So the, one of the main reasons that uh, that the life expectancy has shot up so so much has been the, our ability to deal with infectious diseases. So that's that's where you see a lot of progress there. So the question is like, are we healthier than 100 years ago? Are we healthier than our ancestors? I generally would say no, because you know we're less physically active and, and we eat we we overconsume empty calories, etc. But um, we're really good at staying alive, and, and a lot of that has to do with infectious disease. So you can you can live a very long, healthy life, and that's the things we're going to talk about here today. All right, uh, let's go ahead and dive in. Do you think being active in later years is related to physical fitness or to nutrition? Is there a relationship between the two? Why or why not? So I, I mean, I think the answer is yes to, to both of them. So uh, if you you know if you're eating to fuel physical activity, then you're more likely to be active. And if you're you know you're if you're physically fit because of exercise and, and lifestyle factors, then you, you're going to be able to do those kind of things, right? Keeping your mobility, keeping your strength, um, taking as much lean mass into your elderly years as possible, the elderly years as possible. These are all really important things. So uh, if you're in too much pain or you're too immobile to be physically fit, uh, to be physically active. Then you're going to have a hard time being physically fit. And if you're eating a very poor diet, so you're always tired and, and malnourished, then that's going to have a big, big impact as well. So I think the two, and the two feed on each other too. I know that um, if you eat well, you are more likely to be physically active. If you're physically active, you're more likely to eat well. You know, like you know, personally, I know that um, um, I don't want to ruin a good training session by eating a poor diet. Uh, or, or, and that's why, like, if I, if I skip an exercise, if, if, let's say I'm hurt and I can't train for a week. Um, I'm more likely to eat poorly that week, just just being honest. So I think the two feed into each other. So the answer is yes, in my opinion. So both, uh, both nutrition and physical fitness um, play critically important roles in being active. When you get older, if you've lost all your muscle mass and you have weak bones, like yeah, you're not going to want to be active. You're gonna you're you're frail, and you're um, you're going to be concerned about fall risk and those kind of things. So the two absolutely feed into each other. So is the relationship between the two? Yes, we and I just explained why. All right, learning objectives for this chapter. Describe the role nutrition plays in longevity. Summarize how nutrition interacts with the physical, psychological, economic, and social changes involved in aging. Lots of stuff going on there. Explain why the needs for some nutrients increase or decrease during aging. Lots of good examples there. You know, just off the top of my head, you've got um, stomach acid changes will impact iron absorption, and we'll talk about B12. That'll be a big one. Uh, identify how nutrition might contribute to or prevent the development of age-related problems associated with vision, arthritis, the brain, and alcohol use. And instruct an adult on how to shop for groceries and prepare healthy meals for one person on a tight budget. Nutrition and longevity. So the aging of the U.S. population, we've already talked about that already, but two motivating goals, promoting health and slowing aging, so which the two are interrelated. If you're healthier, if you're healthier then you will um, age uh, more gracefully, so to speak. Ratio of old people to young people is incre increasing. We talked about how you know the 20% uh, of the U.S. population is above the age of 65, and how 85 plus is actually the fastest growing um, age group, which you see there. So growing old happens day by day. Yeah, that's very true. You know, you look you look back and you think, you know, I don't, you know, I had my birthday recently and I don't feel any different uh, than, than I did yesterday, but um, I do feel different than I did five years ago and 10 years ago, and and I can only imagine what my 84th birthday is going to um, feel like compared to my 40th. Fourth. 
uh, factors influencing life, life expectancy. We've talked about um, infectious diseases when you're young. You know, surviving through childhood is, is a huge, huge part of it. Uh, trauma and injuries, so high-risk behaviors. Uh, genetics play, play a very, very big role. And then the, the, what we primarily can control then is diet and lifestyle factors. Observation of older adults. Physiological versus chronological aging. Uh, so physiological age, re age refers to a person's health status, may be different from their chronological age. So this is really clear uh, examples. You um, you know you see someone that's in their in their 80s or 90s that still still their mind is still firing away. They can still take care of themselves. They can you know they can do a lot of activities of daily living. So you got a, a physically and mental, mentally active 90 year old, and then you have someone that you know like my grandmother. She had rheumatoid arthritis and she was basically disabled um, in her mid 50s. So when she was in her 60s, um, you know she had she had difficulties that someone might have not have in their 90s. So we all know someone that's in their 60s and is, has sadly already died or um, have serious health problems. They, so they have a, a lower chronological age, but a higher physiological age. Their body is aging more rapidly. And then we all know someone that's, that's old, so their chronological age is higher, but their physiological age is lower. I had patients back, you know, back in the day when I saw patients, I remember I had a patient that was 72 years old and he still logged about a thousand miles a year on his treadmill. He was extremely healthy, right? You would, you, I mean, he had the physiological age of someone in his fifties. I had a patient that was in their sixties and they would rollerblade into the practice. You know, it was just really, really cool to see these kind of things. But then you have people that are just, I mean, even in their thirties that just can barely function. So that's the difference between your physiological age and your chronological age. Your chronological age is how many days have you been on this earth? Your physiological age is how, how much has your body aged? So things like extreme stress and poor diet, poor physical activity, all those things will accelerate aging. All right, healthy habits, eating. So what, you know, what healthy older people kind of have these things in common? Eating well-balanced meals, nutritious meals, engaging in physical activity daily, you know, not always structured exercise, but physical activity, keeping their step counts up and yeah, your step count and life expectancy are definitely linked together. You know, whether it's a correlation or causation is a whole another question, but uh, I'll, I'll do a separate video presentation on that on non-exercise activity thermogenesis. It's a, it's a talk I've been giving recently people really like, so I'll, I'll throw a video up of that sometime. Uh, not smoking, not using alcohol or using it in moderation, which basically means like one drink a day for females and two drinks a day days from a day for males and even then that second drink doesn't seem to be super beneficial so generally one drink a day um, maintaining a healthy body weight sleeping regularly and adequately relieving stress by focusing on a sense of purpose so a lot you look at like the blue zones the parts of the world where people typically live longer um, families usually a huge deal and elderly people they, they still have a purpose and that is their family they often live with their family they help care for their family members you know they call it like the grandparent effect so having a sense of purpose is very important you look at the number of people that you know they retire and they kind of lose their purpose which was their career and they and they age pretty rapidly and they don't do very well so keeping a sense of purpose is is very big deal having a community of family and friends who just mentioned that. So support, purpose, diet, exercise, not doing things that are very harmful for your health like smoking. It's This is the blueprint for living a long, healthy life. Not guaranteeing it, but it's, a, it's, it's, it's increasing the likelihood that you will have a long, healthy life. Knowledge check ones. So you can pause this and try to answer these questions quick. Aging is an inevitable process programmed into our genes. The process can be slowed by adopting healthy lifestyle habits. So aging is inevitable. You know, they're, they're either, I have a book behind me. You probably can't see it, but I have a book called Ending Aging that's looking at, you know, uh, it's, from, it's from an Aubrey de Grey who's the head of the Methuselah Foundation that's trying to basically, trying to make a 70 the new 30 and then trying to extend life. It's pretty cool, the stuff they think about. But, um, but as, of, as for now, aging is an inevitable process. You, you, can, you can slow it, but... Um, and some pe people are going to age at different rates, but it is inevitable. Um, why is that? It's an interesting question. So, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint, your your genes are designed to your your to help you know you survive long enough to reproduce. Once you've reproduced and had your offspring, there's no longer any selection pressure on you. So, if you age rapidly and you have you know dementia or heart disease and you die in your 50s, or if you age really well and live to be 100, there's no there's no selection pressure that chooses those genes that allowed you to live to be 100 years old because the 56-year-old that died and the 100-year-old that died both had their kids when they were 20, so their genes were already passed on. So there's just so evolution can't really help us when it comes to aging. So if you if you're lucky enough to have genes that make you more likely to live to be 100, that's great. But you're just not more likely to pass them on than someone that doesn't have them because uh, because everyone's had their kids by then. 
All right, um, good nutrition aids in maintaining a healthy body and can improve the quality of life. And that's why I think that you know, eating well and, um, you know, I know plenty of people that live into their 70s and 80s and beyond that don't eat well and don't practice all these habits, but um, the quality of life is the key. And that's why, especially with exercise, I think if you if you exercise, you may not live that much longer, but, and most of the time that you live longer, you would have spent exercising, but um, your qual some studies show your quality of life can be 300% higher or more you know like being able to physically take care of yourself and having a brain that still functions well in in, in old age is super important so quality to me quality over quantity for sure I don't want to live to be 120 and feel like a 120 year old right I want to live um, as long as I can um, where I can take care of myself take care of my family not be a burden on my family and have a good quality of life I know like my grandfather, you know, the last couple of years of his life, he lived to be 93. The last couple of years were really, really rough. I don't know if he would have wanted them or not, you know, to be honest, because the quality of life wasn't there. Uh, life expectancy in the United States is currently 79 years. It's a little higher for females and lower for males. But some evidence is starting to come out that that number is starting to drop. And I've been expecting that for years because you've got, uh, you know, our diet and lifestyle changes, uh, they've been exceedingly worse. Uh, med modern medicine is amazing and it's great at keeping us alive, but... Uh, um, there, at some point, the, 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 we are going to pay for our diet and lifestyle choices. All right, benefits of physical activity in older adults. A uh, lot, you know, obviously lot, lots and lots of them, but staying strong, staying mobile, um, having the endurance you need to, to take care of yourself and your activities of daily living. I know that's a really low bar for someone that's younger, but being able to take care of yourself. I mean, like I, I remember, again, my grandmother, rheumatoid arthritis, you know, type 2 diabetes, basic caring for herself, making food, using the restroom, etc. Those kind of things became difficult. And uh, I always like to say life is sport. And we're all, we're all going to be, we're all training right now. So I'm 44. I'm training for the elderly Olympics. I'm training to be, to be in my seventies and still be able to take care of myself. I, I want to win the get off the toilet championship. I want to lift, I want to, I want to, uh, I want to win the, the gold medal for being able to go to the grocery store and buy my groceries and carry my groceries in and put my groceries away. I know it's a low bar, but you at least want to meet that. You can, you hopefully will exceed that and be that person that rollerblades to the clinic or be that person that logs a thousand miles on the treadmill. But you at least want to, you want to, you want to have that base level of strength and flexibility and mobility and endurance um, so you can take care of yourself. Addition and play with your kids, right? Play with your grandkids, etc. Additional benefits from specific activity types, so aerobic activities, we just talked about, you know, keeping your heart and lungs healthy, moderate endurance activities, so you can have the stamina needed to, to do the things you need to do, play with, again, playing with your grandkids, your great grandkids, pushing them on the swing, etc. Strength training, uh, you want lean mass, it keeps, it helps control blood sugar, it keeps you from, uh, hopefully decreases fall risk, etc. Resistance training for holding on to that muscle that you carried into old age with you. Uh, and then physical activity is the most powerful predictor of mobility in later years. It once you stop doing something, this is from a uh, this is from a powerlifting legend named Louis Simmons. The quote was, "Once you stop doing something, that's when you can't do something. So if you stop moving, of course you're going to lose your mobility. If you keep moving, you're way less likely to lose it." All right, exercise guidelines for older adults. You see here. Uh, aerobic activity, be active five minutes. At mi these are minimum, right? Start easy and progress gradually. Be active for a minimum of five minutes on most or all days. At least five days per week of moderate activity or at least four days per week of vigorous activity. If As the activity gets more vigorous, then the amount of time and the number of days you do it goes down because you need more time to recover from it. Intensity, moderate, vigorous, or a combination, like I just mentioned. Duration, at least 30 minutes of moderate activity in bouts of at least 10 minutes each, or at least 20 minutes of continuous vigorous activity. I generally recommend the 10 minute walk after each meal. That's three 10 minute moderate activity sessions, super easy, almost everyone can do it. Cautions and comments, comments stop if you are breathing so hard you can't talk, or if you are feeling dizziness or chest pain. Strength training, um, using no weights or weights up to two pounds. Do one set of eight to 12 repetitions twice a week. Again, that depends on where you're at. I sure hope that when I'm older, um, I, I can lift more than two pounds. But, uh, uh, and I'm not afraid to have people lift heavier weights than that, as long as it's safe, controlled environment, etc. Frequency, at least two non-consecutive days per week. Non-consecutive being important, so you can recover from the first session before you have the second one. Um, Moderate to high intensity, 10 to 15 repetitions per exercise and gradually increase the weights. Um, eight to 10 exercises involving the major muscle groups, so full body routines. Uh, breathe out as you contract and in as you relax. Do not hold your breath. Use smooth, steady movements. Again, work with your trainers and, and, and 
therapists and stuff with that kind of things. Balance. Hold, uh, so starting easy, hold on to a table or chair with one hand, then with one finger. So you're just removing your support and making it more difficult. Uh, two to three days per week, at least 20 to 30 minutes. Incorporate balance techniques with strength exercises as you progress. That's why I like Pilates because Pilates is kind of like balance, strength, core work, etc. cetera. Uh, yoga would be the same thing. Um, flexibility, hold stretches for 10 seconds. Do each stretch three times. That'd be starting slowly. At least two days per week, preferably on all days that aerobic or strength activities are performed. Uh, generally, stretching is better as part of a cool down than a warm up, just so you know. Moderate intensity, stretch your major muscle groups for 10 to 30 seconds, repeating each stretch three or four times. And then cautions and comments, stretch, at, stretch after strength and endurance exercise for 20 minutes, three times a week. Use slow, steady movements, bend joints slightly. So that's a huge deal, the whole after instead of before. For years, stretching was part of warm up routines, but you don't see it much anymore because the evidence has shown that it can increase injury and decrease power production. So I like to do active warm-ups like mobility type active warm-ups before training and then just your static stretching it's called after. All right, manipulation of the diet. This is just, you know, interesting I guess, but manipulation of the diet, energy restriction in animals. So studies have shown for years that, you know, starting with fruit flies and worms and animals live longer and have fewer age-related diseases if you restrict their energy. So it does, it, it appears to slow the aging process. This is where um, there are people that do this. There's like calorie restriction societies where um, you consume 70% of normal energy intake, but, but prevent malnutrition. So you get all the nutrient needs you need, but consume less calories. It basically slows your metabolism and increases antioxidant activity, increases repair mechanisms like autophagy is one of them, the, the big ones. Um, but this stuff is not really panned out in humans the way it has other animals. And part of it's the bottom line there. Age of starting energy restriction. You, the, the reason that animals live longer when you put them on these kind of diets is it delays puberty, it delays maturation, and delays the aging process. So if you decide in your 40s to start doing this because you want to live longer, you're not going to see anywhere near the same benefits you see in animals that do this for their entire lives. So I don't know about this. Um, I, I, I used to be a, a bigger fan of it. But um, the other big thing here is, if you do this, you um, so so yeah. Mechanistic studies show that you know decreasing protein intake, decreasing calorie intake can increase enzymes that lead that might lead to aging and or to slowing aging, increase DNA repair. All these things sound great, but here's the other problem with this: in the real world, if you do this, you will not have muscle. You you will be on a diet your entire life. So yes, you might live a little longer, but I would jokingly say you'll, it'll feel like forever because you know we all know what it's like to be on diets. But how will you build lean mass? How will you maintain lean mass? So my concern is that yes, you might have some more DNA repair, but you're not gonna be strong, your bones are gonna be weak, you're gonna fall, you're gonna break your hip, and that's gonna change your life forever, right? So, so I think that being strong and capable and carrying as much lean mass into your elderly years as possible is, is critically important. So a diet that's higher in protein, meets your needs, allows you to be big, you know, can be stronger. Yeah, you might not have as much DNA repair, but you'll be able to move and take care of yourself and hope and if and hopefully not fall. And if you do fall, hopefully not break a hip, et cetera, et cetera. So make sure you look at the whole puzzle, right? These kind of studies have shown mechanistically how at an enzyme level they might be able to slow the aging process, but I, the last thing I would ever tell someone to do is to go on a diet that causes sarcopenia, that causes them to lose muscle and lose muscle function as they get older. So be careful with this stuff. Just, just my little note. And I most people aren't going to go on a diet for their whole life. You know, uh, it would actually work better if you started in, in childhood at some point. But uh, most people don't do this. But just keep in mind, you'll probably see articles about this, and just, just be cautious when you think about these kind of things. I know my opinion has changed over time because I just, I value lean tissue too much. Uh, difficulty defining energy restriction, like where, you know, wh where would you need to be? Um, time of energy restriction needed to realize health benefits. Like, so you have to do this for one year, five years, ten years, twenty years. We, we don't haven't done studies in humans over that long a period of time, so we don't know. Uh, and that's why, again, in, you can maybe double the life expectancy of a fruit fly, but when they did studies in primates, you didn't see as good of results. And, and the human, I would say if you did this, just based on what I've seen, you might be able to expect it to, be, you know, to live five or six years longer. But you can, you can live that much longer with positive, you know, healthy diet, healthy activity levels, but also have more muscle and, and these types of things if you do other things. So I, I just don't know. I, I, I just don't know what, how I feel about this. But. 
All right, uh, so a moderate restriction, 10% reduction in energy intake does have benefits. I mean, I agree with that. You don't want too many calories. You don't want to be carrying a bunch of fat around. Um, so you, you want, to, you want to, uh, to, to eat an appropriate amount of food without being too restrictive. Uh, nutritional adequacy essential to a long and healthy life, no matter how many calories you're eating. Absolutely. All right. Um, so speaking of uh, like body fat versus muscle and those kind of things before we get into the aging process, remember when we talked about BMI and those kind of things, that being slightly, you know, having a BMI that puts you in the slightly overweight category is actually um, adv advantageous over being underweight. So, and I think that's a lot of that's because if you get sick, if you have, you know, cancer, infectious diseases, you need that extra fat, you need the extra fuel to, to deal with those types of things. But just, just something to consider that being a little, you know, carrying a couple extra pounds around is, is maybe better for you than being a couple pounds underweight. But it's hard to tell because is that a cause or effect, right? If someone's underweight, is it because they have an underlying disease, a gut disease or cancer or something already? I don't, I don't know. All right, so stress, uh, psychological and physical stressors, your body's sp uh, stress response system. We have uh, nervous and hormonal systems. And then, and the, so there's, uh, you know, again, we talk about, you see your differences between men and women. women the, you know, again, this is way too typical, right? Typical man, typical woman. There's all sorts of overlap here. It's a spectrum. But um, males are more likely to have the fight or flight response. Uh, women, uh, females more likely to have the tend or befriend response, they say. But again, that's, those are, we're stereotypical male, stereotypical female. But the stress response, remember, stress, stress is not a bad thing, right? Excessive stress is. Um, stress is what your body adapts to. So we have what's called the stress recovery adaptation process. So stress can be good, right? The stress of an exam coming up motivates you to study and motivates you to learn. That's positive stress. Exercise is stressful. But you, how your body, re so stress, recover, adaptation. How your body recovers from, from the stress from exercise and how your body adapts to the exercise is what makes it good for you. So exercise is bad for you while you're doing it. How your body recovers from it is what makes it good for you. Same thing with like uh, eating plant, you know, produce, right? Uh, the phytochemicals, the antioxidants, the, the nutrients that are in plants, like vegetables that make them good for you, they're actually mildly toxic. So, so plants, so vegetables are bad for you, exercise is bad for you. I'm saying this as a joke, but for real, um, the phytochemicals that are in plants are mildly toxic, how your body responds and adapts to them is what is what increases the antioxidant capacity in the body. So exercise is bad, how your body responds to it makes it good. Eating plants is bad, how your body responds to them makes them good. That you know those those are examples of of stress recover adaptation. Uh, physiological changes associated with aging, uh, body weight, the lowest mortality correlates with a slightly higher BMI. So like I mentioned, carrying a few extra pounds around, having a BMI a little bit above 24.9 is better than being underweight. Um, older adults who are obese still face serious medical complications at least until the age of 85. So ex some extra fat is good, too much extra fat, lots of problems. Body composition over time, a typical person, I'm saying typical because doesn't, doesn't, you can slow this process, but a typical person as they get older, they have a loss of bone and muscle and they gain body fat. And sarcopenia, I just mentioned, that's the, that's the loss of, of muscle. So you see here what's happening in these images. Someone, they might weigh the same amount, but they have less lean tissue, more body fat. And this, this, this happens over time. Now, it doesn't happen as fat, it doesn't, it happens faster than it needs to, because if you're if you're eating well and you're physically active and you're strength training, you you the whole the goal the goal in your 70s and whatnot is to hold on to the muscle you have and not not let your body transition this bone bone and muscle to fat. Not saying that muscle becomes fat, but uh, uh, you know not getting to where you're losing bone and muscle while you're gaining fat. You can slow this process down and maybe maybe completely stop it at least for a while. All right, um, immunity and inflammation. So the immune system loses function with age. That's just, you know, like other, like other parts of your body, uh, a lot of your immune cells become senescent is the term, which means that they just don't function well and they actually just promote inflammation rather than doing their job. So those are called, that's called immunosenescence. Um, inflammaging, so that's this, the inflammation associated with, with normal typical aging. Um, inflammation is critical in supporting your health. So that's one thing. We talk about inflammation like it's bad. Um, inflammation is needed. Uh, you know, acute short-term inflammation like after uh, is part of your immune system. So inflammation associated with uh, fighting off an infection is good. Inflammation associated with a sprained ankle or something is good. Um, strength training exercise causes inflammation. The inflammation leads to the recovery and the adaptation. So inflammation is great when appropriate. Um, chronic inflammation, just, just high baseline levels of inflammation is not good. That's why interestingly enough, 
they talk, you know, studies show that um, taking anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen on a regular basis actually decreases the adaptation that occurs from exercise because you are blunting the inflammatory response that your body needs to promote recovery and adaptation. But if you're older, so if you're if you're inflamed in your 60s, then taking ibuprofen will actually promote the increase in lean mass and muscle. And I think that's because if your inflammation is normally low, then after exercise, the spike in inflammation is noticeable and leads to adaptation. If your inflammation levels are always high, then the spike in inflammation with, with exercise isn't as noticed. So if you lower, if you, so if you, if you take ibuprofen as a 20 year old, you're decreasing that inflammatory spike and decreasing the response. If you're older and you already have a high baseline of inflammation, dropping it with ibuprofen makes the spike that occurs with training exercise more noticeable. So it's so kind of interesting. All right. Uh, infl- compromised by nutrient deficiencies. So again, inflammation, uh, nutrient deficiencies make inflammation worse. A diet that's low in nutrients, high in inflammatory fats, etc., is bad. Improving the immune system response, uh, how you do that, regular physical activity, absolutely strengthens the immune system. Di- nutrient-rich diet, including diet-rich in fruits and vegetables. So antioxidants, phytochemicals, all your vitamins and minerals, etc. So immune system, we'll cover more in our disease prevention chapter, but, uh, but basically every nutrient plays a role in your immune system. But the big ones would be getting enough, you know, vitamin A, uh, vitamin D, iron, uh, those types of things. GI tract, this is a big one. When I think about aging, I think about the fact that, you know, you're not what you eat, you're what you absorb. So as you get older, if, a, if digestion and absorption get impaired, then you need more nutrients because the nutrients you are eating are less bioavailable. So when I think about someone in their 60s, 70s, and 80s versus their 20s, 30s, and 40s, this is the biggest thing that I, that I think of is as digestion gets worse, your food needs to become more nutrient dense because if you're absorbing a smaller percentage of the nutrients you eat, then you have to eat more more of those nutrients. All right, so GI tract changes contribute to poor appetite, early satiety, and malnutrition. So when you need a more nutrient-dense diet, you often will lose your appetite. So that can, you know, that can be a, a big, a big issue. Um, so you, you, you're not going to want to eat as often. You'll get full faster. So that's a terrible combination. Poor digestion with eating less means less nutri- nutrients entering your bloodstream. Uh, one common example that we I use this in case studies all the time in anatomy, especially nutrition as well, um, is atrophic gastritis. So basically, uh, it's an inflammatory condition in the stomach called you know gastritis that leads to a uh, loss of function. So uh, the simplest way to look at it is parts of your stomach kind of become a scar rather than functional stomach tissue, which means that you're going to have less stomach acid, less less enzymes, etc. So atrophic gastritis affects uh, absorption of nutrients are impaired, especially vitamin B12, and that's I mentioned that at the beginning, but that's that's because this, one of the things the stomach produces is a compound called intrinsic factor. An intrinsic factor is needed for the digestion and absorption of vitamin B12. So the less functional stomach tissue you have, the less B12 you will have. And that's why if someone has atrophic gastritis and it leads to a B12 deficiency, which usually will show up as a B12 deficiency anemia, but also can be uh, show up as neurological problems. They, will, they, they might put you on a B12 supplement, but the simplest solution is a B12 injection. They, they skip the gut altogether and they inject the B12 into your body. Uh, dysphagia, so that means difficulty swallowing. So the texture of the diet often requires modification. So trouble swallowing, maybe poor dental health, maybe having dentures means that you'll need a lot more soft foods and less fibrous foods and foods are difficult to chew. All This, this occurs very commonly. Uh, constipation. So the intestinal walls lose their strength, so motility is slowed, so you're way more likely to become constipated as you get older. So the solution for that is increased fiber intake. You know, like as in a, when you get older, maybe you start using Metamucil because it's, you know, softens your stool and increases fiber intake. Uh, finding more soluble fiber in your diet. Uh, so, so fiber and then also water. You don't want to consume more fiber without more water because it'll, it will suck water into your gut and you need the water in the rest of your body as well. So fiber, water, and then exercise. Staying physically active, very important. I had lots of elderly patients that were dealing with constipation. And then if though, if fiber, water, and exercise are not enough, then you speak to your doctor about maybe drugs or, or things like that that will, that will help you. Hormone secretion. Uh, diminished appetite leads to lower energy intake and weight loss. So this, you know, again, it can be good if you're carrying excess fat around and you want to lose it. But uh, um, if you're losing lean tissue as you get older, I, I really can never say that's a positive. Tooth loss. 
Uh, difficult and painful chewing, which limits food selections, less dietary variety, lower intakes of fiber and vitamins. I mean, if, you, if you have trouble chewing food, then you're gonna you're, you're gonna only eat certain types of food because they'll be soft, and you and you're, and, you're, and if you if it's hurt to chew, you're gonna eat less. So that's you know I know I I've, I have dental issues and I'm I have to get an implant here in the back, so I'm missing some teeth. I don't eat crunchy foods. I don't like um. Uh, I just don't, right? So like a, a lot of times with vegetables, I'll, I'll blend them up into smoothies and things like that. I can eat lots of vegetables, but I won't eat a piece of celery. I actually broke a tooth on a piece of celery one time. I don't eat chips. I don't eat crunchy foods. So I guess you can limit limit your intake of some of your bad foods too. But but I know as a 44-year-old that my mouth situation already limits my food selections. So if I have even more dental problems down the road or I have false teeth or something, I know it will impact my dietary choices. So less variety. So you got to make sure you're getting your vitamins and your fibers and everything somewhere. Sensory losses and other physical problems like vision, mobility, hearing, taste, and smell, all these can impact uh, dietary intake and physical activity. Other changes, uh, psychological changes. I'm going to take the clock here, sorry. Got to pick up Oliver. He's at camp today. Um, psychological changes. We have depression, which can lead to a loss of appetite and loss of motivation to cook, a loss of motivation to eat healthy foods then. Um, support and companionship of family and friends makes a big deal. And, you know, uh, uh, Someone living alone is definitely going to be more likely to be depressed. Um, economic changes, so living arrangements and income. I think about if you're, if you're barely surviving uh, month to month on your retirement, income or something like that or or government assistance then time you know it's going to be hard to buy uh, nutrient nutrient rich foods social changes malnutrition is most likely to affect those living alone especially men those with low income and and or education so let's say that a man was was married lost his wife he's 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 definitely the highest risk category especially if he doesn't have a lot of money and doesn't know how to prepare food highest risk category to eat really really poorly and and lose a bunch of weight and be malnourished so living alone, male, low income, lower education level, all those put you at risk for malnutrition with aging. That's where the food, Meals on Wheels and other programs like that or church-related programs, why they're so important. Having someone looking out for you, making sure you're getting, you're getting your nutrition. I know, you know my grandmother, um, she... You know, her children played a really big role in making sure she had the food that she needed, but then also Meals on Wheels and those kind of programs um, were a big help as well. Discussion question one, do you know someone who is considered elderly? Which outward signs of aging do you notice in them? Can you identify things you can do to help, that should be help, with some of the changes they experience as they age? So you've got to think about that for yourself, but um, let's talk about what it says here. One area of aging students might identify with are social changes, especially in the elderly who live alone. Um, students might also easily identify physical changes and psychological changes and should be able to identify ways in which those changes become obvious and what can be done to help the elderly with those changes. So maybe losing muscle, gaining fat, skin, hair changes, those kind of things. Um, but the big ones are activities of daily living, right? How can you help someone stay mobile and active enough to take care of themselves? So help, you know, give give people a, a help them when possible, but but don't don't help somebody so much that you're um, actually hurting them in the long run. Energy and nutrient needs of older adults. So water. Uh, so the you know uh, elderly people may not feel as thirsty, and that and that's that's a big problem. As the thirst mechanism goes away, you have to kind of remember to drink water because your body's not reminding you to do so. So that's the thirst response is a big issue, and, and so thirst response and dry mouth those, those can be impacted by in, in the older years. Dehydration, your total body water does decrease with age. Sadly, that's part of the aging process as our tissues kind of dry out. Uh, so, you're, so you see here prevention, at least six glasses of water a day. They generally recommend eight to 12, but as you get older, um, less total body water, which means I guess you need less intake. But you know that's, that's at least, right? That's a minimum. I still recommend, are you urinating every three hours? Is it pale yellow? Those recommendations don't change for me, but your overall needs might drop a little bit. Um, the risks associated with dehydration, well, you already have less body water. So if you're losing body water, you're, you're losing, if you lose a pound of water weight, you lost a larger chunk of you because your total body water is lower. And that's why um, between the, less th the lower thirst response and less total body water, that's why the elderly are at, are at very high risk for dehydration in ways that you know, middle-aged people are not. So the youngest young and the oldest old are at the highest risk of dehydration. Okay, energy and energy nutrients. Energy needs decline and estimated at 5% per decade. So um, I got a gnat floating around here, sorry. Uh, um, so basically, yeah, you look at the basal metabolic rate 
drop somewhere in the neighborhood of 1% to 2% uh, per decade, but energy needs go down 5% per decade, and that has to do with, so it's, it's not just basal metabolic rate dropping. Activity levels drop. And, new, and I'll, do, I, I, the, I'll do that neat presentation, that whole presentation I was talking about earlier, where we talk about what happens to our metabolism. So I'll make sure I do a video about that. But the newest research done, gold standard research using double labeled water, has shown that really between your 20s and your 60s, your basal metabolic rate doesn't need to drop. Um, your, your energy expenditure drops because you start moving less. And because you're moving less, then you're going to lose lean tissue. And that's why your metabolic rate drops. So if you stay active and you exercise, you, you can't blame aging on your low metabolism until you get into your you know 70s or above. Because then your metabolism truly drops. Your brain uses less energy. Your liver lo loses less energy. So our energy needs do decline, but it not necessarily doesn't have to. right? Stay strong. Keep your lean, lean tissue. Stay active. And your metabolism can stay elevated uh, definitely past your 30s. 30s and 40s where most of us start to blame our, our, our decreased metabolic rate on weight gain. So it's an effect, not a cause. All right, nutrient needs do remain high, so make sure you're following all the food patterns, the or my plates and those kind of things. Protein's especially important because we need more protein to stimulate protein synthesis in the in the, in elderly and digestion of it goes down. So you need more protein, you're going to get more, less of it from your food, so you must eat plenty of protein as you get older to at least preserve lean mass, if not try to build some. Um, so look for low calorie sources because if you need you need less calories but more protein, then the protein you eat needs to come from lower calorie sources. So leaner pieces of meat or other sources like that. Um, liquid nutritional formulas, if if digestion's a problem, then then getting things that are that are basically pre-digested or, or in a um, more bioavailable forms, nothing wrong with that. If you're not hungry, then these are good ways to get more calories. So the same things that you would tell someone to do, uh, you know, like liquid calories, you would say don't do that when you're younger because you, you you might those are you might be gaining weight too quickly. In this situation, you need to get these calories into somebody the best way possible. So protein shakes, uh, liquid calories, whatever. All right, reflection. So pause and try to answer these. Energy needs decline with age on average by five percent each decade. But again, that's not needed. You know, my metabolic rate has gone up. Um, I get my resting energy expenditure tested, and uh, my metabolic rate has gone up. I don't um, in the last couple of years because of strength training. My resting energy expenditure has gone up 140 calories a day, and it's still climbing. So my I plan on my metabolic rate as a 45 year old being higher than it was as a 30 at a 35 year old. So um, these declines are are an effect of our loss of activity and function more than anything. Older adults need fewer calories but have high nutrient requirements. For this reason, nutrient-dense foods are needed. Protein is important for supporting a healthy immune system. It also prevents muscle wasting and optimizes bone mass. So you, again, don't want to lose lean tissue, muscle, or bone. Sufficient carbohydrate intake protects against protein being used as energy. So that's why, you know, um, remember carbohydrate, sorry, it's your nose again. Uh, carbohydrates are protein sparing because if you're not consuming carbohydrates, your body has to turn protein into carbohydrates in a process called gluconeogenesis. All right, discussion question two. How do basal metabolic rate and physical activity change with age? I just mentioned a lot of that, but these are these are what we see not doesn't need to happen. Uh, BMR declines one to two percent each decade due to reduced lean body mass and thyroid hormones. Physical activity tends to decline. So yes, hormone levels change. But we, it, we don't have to lose lean body mass, which means that our metabolism doesn't have to drop in our 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. Again, 70s and 80s, you will see your basal metabolic rate will drop. Things like liver, liver metabolism, brain metabolism. But physical activity tends to decline. So I think the activity decline leads to the lean body mass losses, not the other way around. Use it or lose it. Carbon fiber needs. So fiber, whole grains, fruits, legumes, which are like beans and peas and stuff, and vegetables. These foods, along with water, alleviate constipation. So remember, fiber, water, exercise are the three uh, pillars of constipation relief. Fats, uh, the polyunsaturated fats provide valuable nutrients because the, that's where your essential fatty acids are. Your omega-3 and omega-6 fats are the essential fats, and they are polyunsaturated. 
Saturated fats raise the risk of atherosclerosis and other degenerative disease, or that should be degenerative diseases. Um, so you remember, saturated fat intake should not be more than 10% of your calories. So uh, dropping your saturated fat intake from 10% to 7 or 8%, you're not going to see a big difference. Dropping it from 12 to 10, you won't see a big difference. But if you're if 20% of your calories are coming from saturated fat and you drop it to 10, you'll see a huge di difference in atherosclerosis and, and cholesterol levels and heart disease risk. Limiting fats may lead to nutrient deficiencies and weight loss. So you do you want to get plenty of fat, just make sure it's the right kind. Vitamins and minerals. So which ones do we have to worry about the most for the elderly? Vitamin B12, I've already mentioned this. People with atrophic gastritis are especially vulnerable. So you can, for, you can use fortified foods and supplements, but if those aren't working, B12 injections work great. Vitamin D, uh, we make less vitamin D as we get older. Maybe we're outside less often, less exposed skin, etc. So for lots of reasons, vitamin D issues can can crop up. So maybe you need to supplement. You know, go to your doctor, get your blood levels tested, uh, take a, you know supplement or change your diet enough to or go outside more so the levels go up. If those things don't work, you can actually do in 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 situations where it's needed, you can do intramuscular injections of vitamin D as well. Uh, folate. Calcium, iron, and zinc, all the, you know, these are just critical nutrients all the time, so make sure you're getting plenty of them. Dietary supplements. Over 50% of older adults use dietary supplements. Recommended by many healthcare professionals, can provide 100% of daily values, thought to be more beneficial than harmful. Again, again, it's a supplement. It supplements a healthy diet. It doesn't replace a healthy diet. But I like these, for, especially for older adults, because if your digestion is impaired, then fill up, you know, top off the tank with supplements. So eat as well as you can, and then use supplements to fill in the gaps. And I've mentioned before that even really healthy diets could be lacking in potassium, magnesium, iodine. Those are a few examples there. And then if you have underlying GI problems, it's only going to be worse. Uh, food is the best source of nutrients for, the, for everybody. Supplements are not a substitute for food. I just said that as well. They're called a supplement because they should supplement the healthy foods in your diet. Nutrition-related concerns of older adults. Vision, so again, not, you know, this is, uh, we won't spend a ton of time here, but cataracts, it's basically an age-related clouding of the lenses of the eye. The, the lenses need to be clear for, thing, for, for what you're looking at to reach the retina at the back of the eye. So cataracts will cloud your vision. Lead to blindness if not surgically removed. Uh, risk factors, you know, generally high blood sugar is a big one, uh, a poor diet. And it's caused by oxidative stress. So a diet that's higher in antioxidants, especially the ones that are really good for your eyes, like lutein, um, will hopefully help prevent these problems. Uh, macular degeneration is the leading cause of vision loss and blindness in the United States anyhow. It's vitamin A deficiency in some, pla in some places. So that's another one. So here we just see you can get how the eye works. Uh, and then you look at the, le you have a cataract clouding vision because it's, it's literally blocking um, what you're looking at from reaching the retina in the back of the eye. Arthritis. This is this is a, a big one. Uh, 50 million Americans are dealing with arthritis pain. That's probably an underestimation. But you know, I mean, just like I mean, me and my wife are both 44, or I'm 44. Should be 44 in a couple months here. Uh, you know, I have I have some arthritis in well, lots of arthritis in my neck, and my wrist, and a knee, right? And these kind and a toe. <laughs> she's got it in both thumbs, and she's had a knee replaced. You know, these this this reality. But um, arthritis, so it's an it's an inflammatory condition. The osteoarthritis is a deterioration of the cartilage in your joints. So I, a simple way to look at it is cartilage um, are shock absorbers, and they protect they protect you from wear and tear. Well, when that cartilage is worn away, now you've got an inflammatory reaction and you got more maybe some more bone on bone contact, and now you're starting to see the bony changes. That's why it's called osteoarthritis. Connection with being overweight, no doubt. I mean, just puts more pressure on your joints. Like, uh, I mean, the arthritis. I've never injured my, my ankle, but I have a little bit of arthritis on an X-ray uh, from an from an ankle, and that's just from carrying more weight around. Uh, benefits of aerobic activity and strength training. If you have arthritis, right, it can hurt, but. There's basically the pain of use and the pain of disuse. So I found that training, yeah, I hurt sometimes. You know, uh, it, it, my knee hurts a little bit sometimes when I do a lot of heavy squatting. But when I when I weighed more and when I was really physically inactive, my knee hurt too. So to me, it's like, do I do I have some pain that's associated with me getting stronger, or do I have pain associated with me getting weaker? I mean, either way, I'm going to get old. Either way, I'm going to be in pain. I'd rather have the pain of use and and maximizing what my body can do functionally than the pain of disuse and deterioration. So just think about that. Like old people are gonna hurt. Are you gonna hurt because you're moving or are you gonna hurt because you're not? That's really what it boils down to. I used to tell my patients that joints don't wear out, they rust out. 
All right. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis is different. It's an autoimmune condition. Your immune system destroys the bone and the cartilage. It's different. Uh, gout can lead to gouty arthritis. It's actually uric acid will deposit in your joints. Imagine like microscopic knives, little little crystallized knives, uh, and they and they can lead to issues. But they uh, they can be that's caused by uh, uh, diets high in purines, which come from um, you know meat consumption, alcohol, fructose consumption, etc. But those are kind of separate. We're mainly just talking about osteoarthritis here. Um, so what do you do? I mean, you, you take care of yourself, protecting your joints as much as possible, moving um, in safe ways, moving as much as you can without in, d doing damage. These, these are all things. But, you know, you work with your a doctor or a trainer on those kind of issues. All right. Um, the Oh, uh, 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 so as far as like supplements and those kind of things, I think the omega-3s, the omega-3 fats, because they're anti-inflammatory, they can play a role. Uh, you know, again, not, not an advertisement, but I like to use this here. I use something called turmeric and boswellia, just like an herbal supplement, not medical advice, but uh, um, I, do, I do think that turmeric is a nice anti-inflammatory ginger. I don't know how much these things help, but to me, I just, you know, I, I hedge my bets. But I would say that the most well-studied thing would be, um, would be the omega-3 fats. So eating, eating your fatty fish, getting some fish oil supplements, etc. All right, the aging brain. Dementia affects 15% of adults over the age of 70. Um, Alzheimer's now impacts one in eight people over the age of 65. That number is, is going up really quickly. And it's not just because we're aging, right? Alzheimer's is, I don't know why, but Alzheimer's is becoming more common and, we, and it can't be explained away by the fact that we're living longer. Uh, brain changes due to genetic and environmental factors. So some things we can control, some, some, things, some, some things we can influence, others we cannot. Uh, characteristic changes with age, loss of neurons, and decreased blood supply. Your brain is going to age, but can you? How much is it going to age, and how much can you slow the aging process? That's the part you can control. Uh, nutrient deficiencies may be a factor in the loss of memory and cognition. So, I mean, if you're if you're malnourished, you're not getting the healthy fats you need, etc. Um, alcohol use and binge drinking can affect older adults and affect the brain. So Alzheimer's specifically, the prevalence in the United States, I just said one in eight people, the third leading, leading cause of death now when you take away cancer and, and cerebro and cardiovascular disease. Uh, you know, so it's a, it's a neurodegenerative disorder. Possible causes, genetic factors, free radicals, oxidative stress, inflammation, all these things. Right, one thing I've seen, um, research out of Stanford showed that the microglia, basically the immune cells in your brain, they become pro-inflammatory. They start churning out inflammation in people that are more likely to develop Alzheimer's. But I, you know, we talk about the plaques and the neurofibrillary tangles. Way too much information for this class, but a lot of the causes are are, are unknown. We're looking more at the effects at the end. Um, so I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. Uh, senile plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. I just mentioned those, like the beta amyloid plaques. They're called um, cardiovascular disease reactors. So really, basically. Um, Protecting yourself from cardiovascular disease is probably the best way to protect yourself from Alzheimer's at this point. So uh, lowering your cholesterol and your blood pressure and, and raising your good cholesterol and all these kind of things. Uh, treatments, I think we got um, a few, we'll talk about the, a couple things there coming up as far as treatments. But uh, um, as nerve cells die, the brain shrinks and loses its ability to think, plan, remember, and form new memories. The fluid-filled spaces within the brain grow larger because the, the brain itself is shrinking, so the fluid-filled areas grow larger. Plaques, which are called beta amyloids, so clumps of beta amyloid protein pieces, block cell-to-cell -cell synapse signals. Tangles, these neurofibrillary tangles, twisted strands of protein, destroy the cell transport system. As plaques and tangles block essential nutrients from reaching the nerve cells, they eventually die. So again, we've seen those things, and we're like, how do we control those? But it appears those are like the effect, not the cause. Uh, but they are there. As, and that's why all, Alzheimer's is really diagnosed upon autopsy. As nerve cells die, the brain shrinks and loses its ability to think, plan, remember, and form new memories, which we just said. Oh, it's just saying the same thing again. Sorry about that. There was a copy and paste issue with that slide. Um, Alzheimer's in the healthy brain. So see a healthy brain on the left, Alzheimer's brain, less functional brain tissue, fluid-filled spaces are larger, and you see the um, healthy nerves versus nerves that have the placking and the tangles. You can read that if you want. Discussion question three. While there is no cure for Alzheimer's, there is treatment. Do you know of anyone with Alzheimer's and what can be done to help them? So you, you think about that. But, so treatment for Alzheimer's, excuse me, disease includes providing care to clients and support to their families. So, you know, we're just basically making the best of a terrible situation. Drugs may be used to improve or at least to slow the loss of short-term memory and cognition, but they do not cure the disease. Other drugs may be used to control depression, anxiety, and behavior problems. 
Um, maintaining appropriate body weight may be the most important nutrition concern for the person with Alzheimer's disease. Perhaps the best that a caregiver can do nutritionally for a person with Alzheimer's disease is to supervise food planning and mealtime. So forgetting to eat is, it would lead to malnutrition very quickly. Food choices and eating habits of older adults. We've mentioned quite a few of these already. Uh, malnutrition and food assistance programs. So one in six older adults are malnourished. Um, contributing factors, again, maybe there uh, could be some memory issues, loss of hunger, loss of thirst, uh, don't know how to prep food properly, low income, all these types of things. Uh, a diminished quality of life. I mean, if you're, mal if you're malnourished and not fueling your body properly, that kind of goes without saying. Then remember that 90% uh, of people that, that are over the age of 65 are taking at least one prescription drug. So f don't forget about food and drug interactions too. All right. Uh, we'll, I think we'll come back to that a little bit. Diminished quality of life. Nutrition screening initiative is screening for malnutrition. And then we have food assistance programs. I mentioned Meals on Wheels earlier. Uh, the OAA nutrition program provides group meals in a social setting. So I, I like that. Uh, meals on Wheels is great if people have trouble getting out. But meals in a social setting is actually really cool because it's a you know double whammy. All right, discussion question four. What are the six ways malnutrition limits a person's ability to function and decreases quality of life? Malnutrition limits a person's ability to function in a variety of ways, including impairing muscle function. So again, if you lose muscle function, you lose the ability to take care of yourself and you, and you have concerns about falling and you, you know, those kind of things. Decreased bone mass, muscle and bone go together. Your body, you know, you, if you don't use your bone, you lose it. Compromising immunity, that you know, COVID taught us a lot about that, about nu nutrient deficiencies and malnutrition and immunity. Um, reducing cognition, super important for anyone, but especially the elderly. Poor wound healing and slowed recovery. It's so like surgery, recovery, and those kind of things. You know, my grandma had a wound that never healed, and that's what killed her. She was septic, and that led to lactic acidosis, and she died. But it was the poor wound healing, the struggle with the wound healing, that was that was really what started the whole process. And then increasing hospitalizations. So that's a good list there of, of reasons not to be malnourished. Meals for singles. Remember we said that people living alone, especially males that maybe have lost a loved one, um, people in lower socioeconomic stat stat status, lower education levels, they're the highest risk for um, malnutrition if they live on their own. So what should they do? Challenges in purchasing, storing, and preparing food. So you've got programs and those kind of things. Maybe family can help. But if you have a limited income, um, foodborne illness risk increases because of leftovers, right? If you're going to, if you make a big pile of food and live on it for days, then the risk of foodborne illness is going to go up. Being a wise shopper, I mean, I think this works for families too, but buy in bulk and store. So can you can you buy food in bulk and put it into, you know, freeze it in individual meals and then cook individual meals using maybe an air fryer or these kind of things. So uh, don't make a bunch of food and let it sit around for days. Um, separate the food before you prepare it and then, or prepare it and then freeze it and then thaw it and reheat it. And, and those are some good examples. Okay, a lot of good stuff there. Uh, now the lesson is over. You should have learned to describe the role nutrition plays in longevity. We hit that really good, especially with calories and nutrient density, etc. Summarize how nutrition imp interacts with the physical, psychological, economic, and social changes involved in aging. We covered all those. And explain why the needs for some nutrients increase or decrease during aging. We covered that, especially the ones that increase. Uh, all right. Uh, identify how nutrition might contribute to or prevent the development of age-related problems associated with vision, arthritis, the brain, and alcohol use. And instruct an adult on how to shop for groceries and prepare healthy meals for one person on a tight budget. Covered all that. One thing I didn't mention that I, that I had in my notes that I wanted to cover. Uh, we were talking about drugs, right? How most elderly people are on at least one drug and some are on many, many drugs. Um, and we, we, I mentioned nutrient and food interactions. But one that I just wanted to talk about because you see it all the time on prescriptions and people don't often know why. Uh, a lot of times drugs will say not to take them with grapefruit juice. So what actually happens there? Grapefruit, ju grapefruit juice will actually increase the amount of drug that's in your bloodstream. And that's because it blocks an enzyme. So grapefruit juice blocks an enzyme called CYP3A4. Don't worry about th that part of it, but cytochrome P450 3A4. That's part of your body's detoxification pathway. So basically it blocks the ability of your body to remove a drug so the levels will elevate in your bloodstream. So that's just interesting, but that's why uh, oftentimes you'll see drugs say not to take with grapefruit juice. So just an interesting little fact there. Okay, I hope this helps. You have a wonderful day. Be blessed.